the box conference, uh, Windows Snyder. She's been here several times. And uh, today, she's going to talk about uh, tools and strategies for securing, a, for securing a large development project. I, I believe she's going to share with us you know, the experiences they have in um, at the Mozilla Foundation for, um, for developing you know, large-scale large, large scale software projects. And uh, maybe just, just a few words about, about Ms. Snyder for, for those of you all who may not be familiar with her. With her. Prior to joining Mozilla, or rather she, she's currently the Chief Security something or other at Mozilla Corporation. <laughs> okay, uh, but prior to joining Mozilla, she was, uh, you know, she's been working in several high-profile organizations uh, like Microsoft and uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also at at, at, at stake. So, uh, without wasting any more time, uh, let's welcome Ms. Snyder. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So I do want to talk to you about uh, what we've been doing over at Mozilla, um, how we are working on securing a tremendous development project, and uh, also you know, give you a chance to follow up from, from last year. Last year, I was here. I'd only been in the job for a few weeks when I, when I came to speak and tell you what we were going to do at Mozilla. So I'd like at this point to uh, have a chance to tell you what we've done and how we're measuring success. So um, for some of you, might not be familiar with Mozilla, so just a little bit of background before we talk about the overall security process that we're now using in place. I think before we talked about what, I, what we were going to implement, now uh, a little bit about what's currently in place and what we're working on for the future in terms of security process, um, and how you can apply this to your own development environment in order to make your development projects more secure. A little bit on how we measure success and the problem security metrics currently, and uh, then give you a preview for what's coming in Firefox 3 in terms of security features, and then you know, talk about the tools that we released uh, a couple of months ago and, uh, and how you can also use them in your, your own environment. So there's, I get a lot of uh, questions about, you know, oh, do you work for Firefox? Well, Firefox is a web browser. Mozilla is the project. And it's, um, it's made up of, of a corporation, a foundation, and thousands and thousands of volunteers, people who are you know, just like you and me, who want to create, promote choice and, 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 and uh, openness on the, on the web. Um, and it's, it is the producer of, of the Firefox browser, which more than 100 million people are using today. So th there's about, it's about 20-something percent um, worldwide, about 100 million users, only about 14.3 percent in, in Asia, um, which we'd like to you know, see come up. So that's one of the reasons I'm out here talking to you guys today. It's, uh, it's got a tre tremendous presence in, in, in Europe. About 28% of, uh, of Europe is running Firefox right now, including Finland, who is a, we're actually at about 45%, which I think is tremendous. 45% of Finland runs, runs Firefox. I don't know why they love us, but they do. And also, you can see, occasionally, other people are running Firefox. So I think security, uh, our, our open and transparent processes are uh, potentially a, a risk to us. You know exposing all the gory details of what's going on internally is, is, is definitely painful. And there's a, there's a good reason that most corporations don't like to do that. Um, but I also think that it's our, our greatest opportunity for improving security and leveraging all the knowledge from the community, especially you guys, um, to help us make the process more secure. One of the reasons that I think transparency really contributes to a more secure uh, project is that the, the community can engage in, in testing and in, in source code review. One of the things that's really different about this project is that with the traditional vendor, uh, you guys get to participate after they, they do all their design behind closed doors, they do their implementation behind closed doors, maybe they bring in some contractors or something to work on the project, but the community only really gets involved after they ship the project and then we have a chance to bang on it and if we identify vulnerabilities, hopefully they report them to the vendor and then hopefully the vendor produces a patch and uh, you know, the cycle continues in that regard. But with Mozilla, because everything's open, you can participate you know, at every stage of the game. Maybe you're not a penetration tester, maybe you're not, um, maybe that's not how you want to spend your time. Maybe you are better at design and security features. Well, you can get involved at, in, in the Mozilla project at any phase of the development process. That means you can participate in design meetings, you can call up, they're, they're posted on the, on the wiki page, you can call up and, and participate. You can, if you have ideas, you can contribute them that way. If you want to uh, you can participate at the implementation level, you can uh, write features. If there's a feature you really want to see, you can write it and advocate for, for getting it into the core browser. You can develop tools that help us with testing. You can develop 
fuzz testers, uh, source code analysis. We have a lot of actual uh, security tool vendors that participate by using the Mozilla source code base to test their own tools. So in that way, they're helping the Mozilla project, but they're also making their own tools better. And then, of course, you can participate in the traditional way once it's shipped, identify a vulnerability, report it to us, hopefully, and we'll ship a patch, definitely, and, um, you know, and work, on, work, on a, work with us in the traditional way. But you can also participate um, all along the process, and that leads to a much richer experience. And it's better for, for all of us in that. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of knowledge out here that we'd like to capture, and not just at the end of the project process, you know, working with penetration testers. Additionally, because the, the, the code base is open, you don't have to reverse engineer trying to figure out proprietary file formats or protocols. Everything's available to you, so you can spend your time in analysis and not trying to do reconnaissance to try and figure out how things work. Additionally, when we say something, you don't, I mean, it's, it's great if you believe us, but you don't have to. You don't have to take our word for it. it you know, you can check our work. The source code is there. We document, you know, what we're working on. We're trying to get better at document, documenting things, but you can, you can sit in our meetings and, uh, and, and listen to them. We know that Microsoft is doing this. Uh, we, and, you know, we're open to it. We're happy about it, actually. We, uh, we found out that they, they had been taking meetings at one of our notes because it came back to us in an email. We're like, oh, that's cool. And we're glad that they're, they're, uh, they're listening. We'd love to hear some feedback, even. Um, Another thing that's different here is that we're trying to do real-time updates on vulnerabilities. When something's announced or someone comes out with a vulnerability, it might be days, weeks, whatever, before you hear a response from the vendor about what, what's, what's really happening here. We try to let you know what we know when we know it so that there's not this guessing going around, that you actually have the real information from the vendor as, as best we know it. And when we make a mistake or we're wrong about something, we say so and you know, correct our information and you know, always give you the most up-to-date information. And that's something that's really different. So we have a security group of about 85 people. It's listed at that URL right there. If you want to check and see who has access to all the bugs, all the, all the security bugs, um, yeah, you, can, you can see who are the individuals in the security group. Now this is also unique because we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to um, share security issues with our community, but at the same time we don't want to put the entire code uh, in the entire user base at risk. There's 100 million people out there, so if we give details of a vulnerability before it's patched, we potentially put those users at risk because we could use that information to you know, uh, construct an exploit or something. So we want to make sure that we're doing something that's reasonable for our users. So the compromise we came up with was creating a security group from the community, and that is represented representative of people in the, in the corporation. It's people at different vendors like Red Hat and IBM and um, Sun, they're, they're people representing all these different vendors who get to con who, who have a, a stake in, in, in particular security issues, and they all contribute ideas. Um, let us know if they uh, you know want to see a different fix. Or contribute to um, the body of knowledge going into making these decisions. So, so that's I think a reasonable compromise between sharing everything with the community and um, and and keeping everything completely quiet. And of course, once once a bug is fixed, we make the details available to everybody, unless it. It, it exposes uh, information about another particular bug. So for example, bugs that are found, let's say, through a fuzzer. If, that, if a set of bugs are fixed that were found by that fuzzer, but other bugs are still there, then you know, those, those bugs, the details of those bugs will have to stay closed, otherwise uh, that, that particular fuzzer might be used to identify other bugs. Uh, things that are, 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 are important here are that we consider every feature a security feature. Every feature is a security feature because they all have an impact on the overall security architecture of the application. That is, they all, you know, we consider whether or not it introduces new entry points into the system. We consider, uh, you know, is it storing files? Is it, uh, you know, what is it doing that can, and how does that impact the overall security of the application? And of course, we design everything with security in mind. Another thing that's really, really different here is that security testing is continuous throughout the development process. But we release the work that we're doing in our security updates every six to eight weeks. Now, other vendors do security updates on a regular basis, but the work that goes into the security updates are vulnerabilities that are identified from the outside. Um, work that is vulnerabilities that are identified through the development process, QA process, if they engage vendors to come in and find those vulnerabilities, those are packaged up in service packs and major releases. And for those vendors, that makes sense because they have applica application compatibility tests that span hundreds of applications. And you know, all that work needs the benefit of a full test pack. But because we have 20,000 people nightly downloading um, uh, nightly builds, we have the breadth of testing that other development environments couldn't put together with all the resources in the world. Right? We've got 20,000 different users with 20,000 different machines, with 20,000 different sets of applications, and 20,000 different drivers, and 20,000 different sets of, of add-ons, visiting 20,000 different sets of websites. That, that kind of breadth is something that we could not possibly, uh, you know, with all the resources we had, we couldn't build that in-house no matter what. So we can get 
uh, a tremendous amount of testing done in a very short amount of time, which means that for you, the user or you know, the, the community member here, you don't have to wait a year to get the benefit of the work that we're doing internally. We put that out continuously. Now one of the things that, uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about metrics in a little bit, is that you see all of the bugs that we're working on. One of the things that we, that we do is make sure that we are threat modeling to make sure we understand where the highest risk components are in the system and help us build test cases for penetration testing and make sure that we've identified all the major um, risks to the system and that we have mitigations in place to address all of those. So one of the things that's um, newer for Firefox 3 is, is component security review. That as we are introducing new features into the system, we are going through component security review to make sure that um, any new threats to the system that are introduced are being mitigated, that the mitigations are adequate, and um, that they have test cases to support it. It also helps us understand how features that are not necessarily considered security features actually have security impact. One of the things that we've identified is that um, in Firefox 2, we had this, we had, we introduced a feature um, called Session Restore. That if you were browsing along and it came time for uh, Windows to install an update and uh, needed to reboot your machine, you've got you know 15 different pages open because you're researching cars or something, right? All that work um, comes up when your browser restarts. So that's important. We didn't think of it as a security feature, but in fact, it is a security feature because it reduces the barrier to entry when someone says, when it's time, when Firefox says, oh, we have an update available to you, do you want to install it now? Users are able to say, yeah, go ahead, because they know that their place is going to be saved. So if anything that contributes to users getting patches installed more quickly, we consider a security feature. So there's kind of a roundabout way of identifying through threat modeling how, how session restore is actually a secu security feature. We didn't think about it that way when we implemented it, but when we think about it now, because it's reducing the barriers to users um, installing updates as soon as they come out. One of the things that we're, we're also doing um, consistently, and everybody should be, is code review. We're making sure that when you're looking at a million, you know, millions and millions of lines of source code, how do you identify how to go about source code review when you've got such a massive project? Well, we began with threat modeling to identify which components were at highest risk. We do code review on those particular components and make sure that we're addressing things as, they, as, we, as we know about them. So if we know about particular code constructs, then we're looking for that set of code constructs as we you know, go through the highest risk components, but also as we write new code. So during peer review for check-ins, we're identifying whether or not any of, those, any of that new code contains any of the set of code constructs that we've previously identified as potentially being security, uh, leading to security issues. So this is a, an example of the sorts of things that we're looking for in proper string handling, arithmetic, arithmetic errors, and so on. But um, the bottom line is that if you, if you start with a, um, if, you, if you can't address everything, because you've got millions and millions of lines of code, and you've got a new code construct now you're, that you're looking for, because you're, you realize, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of this before, but this particular con code construct can lead to security issues. How do you go about you know, going through millions of lines of code by hand, potentially, and, and, and identifying that? Well, that's difficult. So what you start with is uh, the, the high-risk areas, and then you maintain it as you add new code. And over time, the, the, code, uh, the code base is replaced, and the areas that you're most concerned with are, are, are addressed. So one of the things we do is before you can check in, it has to be peer-reviewed, and they go through this code review process. And you can develop confidence, at least, for the new code, and the old code um, you know, is potentially mitigated by, maybe mitigated by other mechanisms, like um, additional uh, input validation. And uh, over time, the legacy code uh, gets replaced with new code, or, or potentially gets re uh, eliminated as part of a, an attack, a sac attack surface reduction um, plan. So one of the things I also think is incredibly important is getting fresh blood into the environment. Most people don't uh, think that they're themselves implementing security issues, but um, we're, none of us are perfect. And additionally, a new set of eyes can really tell you things that you, know, you, you might not expect. Security consultants go around to other environments, and they get to see what everyone else is doing. So in your own environment, you might be heads down um, and doing what you think is great work. And it probably is great work, but these other people have had a chance to look at all these different environments. And so they can tell you, you know, they've seen this before, and this is how it was solved, or um, you know, uh, uh, this has caused problems in the past, and you know, uh, maybe it's not an issue for you right now, but it might be in the future, so you wanna, might want to put a mitigation in place for that. So it's a different perspective. They're not personally invested in, in, in the way things have been implemented or architected, so there's no um, ego attached to how it is currently implemented. So 
they can be a, a, a neutral uh, third party to help you, you know, walk through some of these decisions. And so we've engaged in a We've engaged a number, of, a number of vendors, and we continue to. So if you guys are doing security consulting, we want to hear about that. Definitely come up to me. I've got my email at the end of the presentation. We're looking to engage security consultants for exactly this reason. We also do automated penetration testing, and we're going to talk about some of the tools that we've been using at the end. But um, we, find we find penetration testing and, and fuzzing to be very effective. We'll talk about some of the results that we're seeing. But we want to specifically target areas that are highest risk, which, again, we identified through threat modeling. One of the things that's especially uh, important about this is that you know, attackers are not following the RFC when they construct their attacks. They're going to do things that are outside of the boundaries. So if you're only doing functional testing to evaluate whether or not your, um, your mechanism is, is, is uh, working within the, um, the specification, you're not going to necessarily find the, the vulnerabilities that a fuzzer might find. And of course, there are things that you can't do um, in an automated fashion, or they're difficult to do in an automated fashion. So we like to, we, we do manual penetration testing in order to get those hard to reach areas. So as, as I mentioned earlier, security updates are incredibly important. And we keep track of not only how quickly we're able to get them out there, but also how quickly users are able to get them installed. Because there's really two parts to this process, right? The overall window for attack, the attacker doesn't care whether the user is vulnerable because there's not a patch available, or if the user is vulnerable because they haven't installed the patch. It's all the same to the attacker. So that's why it's important for us to consider not just how long did it take for the vendor to get the patch out there once the patch is, uh, once the vulnerability has been identified, but also how long does it take to get installed. So one of the things that we're working on is really reducing the amount of time it, it, it takes for both of those windows. One of the problems with looking at the number of vulnerabilities as a, as a, as a metric of, of, of success is that you can't really tell from project to project how many vulnerabilities there are. You can tell with Mozilla because we make all this stuff, all this information public. But for all the commercial vendors, you only know the vulnerabilities that they have fixed through security updates. And like I said earlier, the security updates are really the number of, of the number of vulnerabilities that have been reported externally that they fixed in security updates. Some get fixed in security patches, and some get fixed in major releases. The problem with that is that it can take a really long time for those for that work to get out there. So we're always looking for vulnerabilities. We'll fix them in security updates. We always, that's always been part of our plan, to do the work continuously and make it available continuously. So users don't have to wait for a major release to get the benefit of the work that we're doing. So I see this with other vendors, and I want to make, make this, uh, you know, I want to make this an industry standard. I don't think users should have to wait for that work. I, I think there's a benefit to, to getting the, the, the massive test pass, but is it really worth the risk of having those vulnerabilities still out there? So I'd like to encourage other development environments to take a look at whether or not it's really warranted. Do they have to wait for this monster test pass? Can they go out in a security update? Yeah, it increases the number of bugs that the rest of the world is counting against you, but you know, what's more important is getting those fixes out there. We've also seen vendors force uh, customers to pay for an upgrade that contains security fixes, and uh, I think that's kind of painful. Um, if there's a security issue in the product, you can fix it in a security update. Putting it into a, into a major release forces users to have to pay for the, for the upgrade. And I don't really think that's fair. And the other aspect of this is that just because you found it by yourself doesn't mean that someone else wasn't able to find it. You know, I'm sure you wrote a clever tool internally to find it, but it doesn't mean that hackers aren't going to be able to uh, write equally or more clever tools to find this and many other bugs. So if you know about it, you can assume that somebody else has found it as well. And there's no, there's no good reason to keeping us users exposed for a year if you've already got the, the fix checked in and it's just waiting for a vehicle. Um, put it into a security update. So I get all these questions from uh, you know, the, uh, the manager, management types at Mozilla and pretty much every other company I've worked, I've, I've worked in. They always ask the question, should I be worried? The answer to that is always yes. But then they ask better questions like, are, you know, are, are we doing any better than we were last year? They ask questions like, you know, what should we work on next? What, what's what's going to be the best way to you know, uh, get the situation under control? And they ask all these different questions. And without any good measure of what you're doing in security, you can't answer any of these, except the first one, which, again, <laughs> the answer is always yes, yes, yes. You should always be worried, and you should be very, very worried. So at Mozilla, we started measuring uh, how we're working on security issues in a different way than, I think, than the industry has been measuring uh, security su success. And you also see the stories like, oh, no, there's you know, four bugs fixed, and, and whatever product comes out. When I see that, I'm just like, OK, the important aspect here is not that product X had four vulnerabilities, it's that, product, it's that vendor X 
fixed for vulnerabilities. That's what's important. So counting bugs doesn't make, doesn't make a lot of sense um, in that it, it encourages people to group bugs together and count things as one bug. It also encourages vendors to, to fix things in service packs and in major releases because then you can't count them. Um, it encourages people to fix things quietly, which we see some vendors do. And I think that's kind of painful because then, first of all, the user doesn't know that they're at risk. And second of all, nobody can evaluate whether or not the vendor's doing a good job. And, you know, I think for the most part, they're, the vendors that we care about are doing some good work. And if they release more data about the metrics, we could, you know, congratulate them on the great work that they're doing. And I think it's our responsibility as the security industry to recognize when vendors are doing good work and, and, and call it out and say that, like, oh, okay, you fixed this, you fixed it, in a, you fixed it quickly, you know, great. You know, yeah, it's a bummer this, this, this bug existed. Maybe it shouldn't have. Maybe it's a dumb bug. You know, we see vendors do dumb things all the time. I see this guy over here smirking in the front row. Yeah, we see vendors do dumb things, but when they do things correctly, when they, when they, when they do things well, you know, we should also congratulate them. And that might make them more willing to share this information with us. So what are we using to evaluate how well we're doing? Well, we're using severity of, 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 of the bug. We're, we're checking on our find and fix rates. Um, we're evaluating how long it takes to fix an, is an issue and then also how long it takes for the user to get the, the, the bug fixed. And this is where we're starting and I'm coming out here you know, to talk to you guys to see if, you know, what other metrics can we, can we look at. Um, I know there's a lot of really smart people working on this problem like Dan Gear and Andy Jaquith and all the people at Security Metrics. There's actually a Security Metrics mailing list and you know, that, they're constantly talking about um, you know, different aspects, things that we've been looking at. You know, number of bugs to lines of code to identify bug density. You know, they're, they're coming up with some really crazy stuff. I mean, well, I mean, crazy in an interesting way, right? Like, that, that's important work. But um, they need to be easy to understand in order to communicate uh, to people about, you know, whether or not this is um, telling, us something, telling us something valuable about the strength of, the, of, the, of the, either the product or the response of the vendor. So severity is important because it helps us figure out what to fix first, right? Just because a bug is rated low doesn't mean that we're not going to fix it. We're going to fix it, but you know, it's it's not going to take pre precedence over the critical security issue that you know is uh, potentially going to have result in users having their machines compromised. So we need to uh, establish a system of what makes sense to work on first, and like when to when to run a fire drill, and when things can get get done in a more um, reasonable fashion. But the bottom line is that every bug with with any security risk is addressed. But there is, no, there is no standard for severity ratings. One thing that we mostly have in common is we mostly agree that critical means code execution from remote. That means different things for, for client products than it does for server products, but after that, it all kind of falls apart. We all have different things. So at Mozilla, we just try to be consistent with ourselves because there is no, no standard. But if we are consistent with ourselves, then we can evaluate ourselves over time in terms of how we're doing and whether or not things are getting better. So. Um, I'm gonna go through this quickly. I mean, the, the bottom line is like these are, these are posted on the web. They haven't they haven't changed. The wording has changed a little bit, but the bottom line is that we haven't really changed what we mean by critical, high, moderate, or low. And again, just because something is low doesn't mean that it's you know unimportant. It just means that it's not as important as all the other uh, all the other bugs that have a higher severity rating. We still fix them. <coughs> so the find rate is one of the things I want to introduce here. That we are tracking how well we're doing in terms of finding bugs. Find rate tells us, you know, how many bugs we've fixed over a period of time, or how many bugs we've identified over a period of time. Now, this this is interesting in, the, in that if uh, our find rate is high, it might mean that the code is bug dense, right? That there's lots of uh, uh, bugs in the code. But it might also be that you've identified some new tools that are really effective at finding bugs, or that there's a new code construct that you've identified that people are now you know searching for, like when when people started realizing that double trees were, were, could result in security vulnerabilities. You know, we would you know, go back over the code base and say, oh, no, I'm finding a whole bunch of other things that we weren't looking for before, right? So um, there's a lot of reasons that the find rate might spike or go up. But tracking it helps you identify um, how well your team is doing at finding bugs. If you start to see that your find rate is going down over time, that might mean that you've flushed out the bugs that, you've know, that you know how to look for, and you can have a degree of confidence about the code base. But it might also mean that um, you're not keeping up with new trends, and you're not keeping up, you're, you're, you're not updating your tools, um, that your people aren't going to conferences like this to learn how to you know, find different kinds of bugs. It might mean that you've, you've kind of reached a, a, a point of equilibrium in your, in, your, in your code where you're not introducing new bugs, but you're also not, learn, not getting better at finding. And um, given the state of the industry where people are constantly uh, identifying new code constructs that result in vulnerabilities and new categories of vulnerability, especially in complex products like web browsers, 
Um, you know, if your find rate is going down, then you need to invest more time in developing tools. Um, it also helps you identify what methods are not very e efficient. Um, source code analysis is, uh, sounds like a great idea initially, and for us, you know, we've, we've spent some time, you know, looking for, you know, great tools that can help us be more effective, but we found that source code analysis, you know, results in a lot of false positives, that uh, we had this one tool that, you know, to the press they announced, oh, there's, you know, we used our tool to find, you know, 300, uh, code constructs that were flagged as potential vulnerabilities in Firefox. Well, when we actually went through all those red flags, we ended up with zero vulnerabilities, and that takes a lot of time. When we find out that like, fuzzers are, you know, you know like a 30% hit rate or something like that, that's, that's a, a better use of our time. It's the same set of resources engaged at, on one a task or the other. So if one task is being fruitful and the other one's not, you can guess where we're gonna put our resources. But keeping track of the find rate, this is an extreme example, keeping track of the find rate, though, really helps us identify what's being effective and what's not. And it also helps you scale. So uh, in, in back into the land of metrics here. There's no numbers on these, but these are in the lands of like, uh, you know, I think the top one's like 80 something, and the, the bottom one's probably somewhere in the 30s, but you get the idea. We're, we're looking at our chart, and we're looking, that doesn't really help us, because that doesn't really say anything very interesting. And then, so we start looking at the spikes to see what's going on over here. And then we realize that these correspond to new tools being introduced to our environment. You know, we've got this guy, Jesse Rutterman, who uh, <coughs> writes a lot of our fuzzers, and the, these, these, these spikes correspond to new tools that he introduces. But you can also see as it tapers off that, you know, oh, okay, so it found a lot of bugs initially, but when, when we, you know, address those issues, we're not, we're not opening new bugs, we're not finding new bugs based on that tool anymore. We can say, oh, this tool's not, it has lost effectiveness over time because it has already found the kinds of vulnerabilities it knows how to look for. So that's really helpful for us. So the fixed rate's the other one, because I think that tells you a lot about your development environment in, in terms of where your, where your efforts are, um, are being deployed. One of the things that's really difficult about you know, trying to get people to fix bugs in a security environment is that security, fixing security bugs is not nearly as fun as finding security bugs, and it's not nearly as fun as creating new, new features. And most of the people who need, to be, who need to work on fixing security bugs are the same people who are creating the, the, the fabulous features that we all enjoy so much, that create delight and, and, and add to the you know, enjoyment of the product. It's hard to feel security uh, fixes, right? So it's hard for people to get excited about that. There are some bugs that take longer to fix. You know, somebody might work on a, a, a week trying to create a mitigation that addresses, you know, three bugs that they know about and maybe a, category, a whole category of vulnerabilities that we haven't, you know, identified that many of. But that might take a really long time because that's an architectural level change. And there's some bug fixes that take like, you know, minutes because it's two lines of code. But it's important to track overall, you know, like are we, has our fix rate gone down because we are left with bugs that are, that are really hard to fix, they're most difficult to fix? That's important to be able to track as well. And if you're left with really difficult bugs, maybe it's time to like take resources off of other things and, you know, get cranking on some of those, those difficult ones. Another thing that's really important to track here is that if your find rate is high and your fix rate is low, you're gonna end up with a backlog. <laughs> and uh, your backlog's gonna keep growing until you get that fix rate up. So that's one of the things that you know, I'm, I'm seeing right now is that we're, we've, we've got, we spent a lot of time getting people rallied to get, you know, help us find vulnerabilities in, in Firefox. And so we, we find our fix rate going, our find rate going up and up, but our fix rate uh, is, is staying the same. And so we, we, we see a backlog growing. So we, we have to you know, bump that up to make sure that we're staying on top of those things. And so we've, we've managed to, to ratchet that up, but again, it's not the most exciting thing to encourage people to work on. And since this is a, a very, uh, very much community project, you have, people have to be excited you know, to invest their, their personal time to do these things. We also have people who are, who are paid to do this, right? But you know, only so many hands to fix, to fix these issues. And some of them are in really complex code and so on. So how do we get better at fixing? Well, implement, implementing mitigations that don't just address one bug, but address an entire category of vulnerabilities. So you can wipe out like 12 or 15 or 20 at a go with a single change. So we've, uh, we've got some of those coming into Firefox in, 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 uh, in Firefox 3. And I think to, to track here is, as you're tracking the fix rate, is how many of these bugs regress? Because it gives you an idea of how good at uh, making stable fixes your environment is. If 25% of your, of your bugs, uh, security fixes, regress, other, other functionality, um, it's going to be used as an objection to why we should fix a particular bug. Because, you know, if, you, if, if, if one out of four causes another problem, then one of, you, know, you end up with this, 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 this uh, you know, never-ending problem of, of, of introducing new vulnerabilities as you try and fix them. So this is our fix rate chart, and uh, you know, it's going up and down. Some of these things are like holidays and, you know, and, and whatever, that, that accounts for some of the fix rate. But like, 
it's not, if you overlap it with the, uh, the find rate, it's, 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 it's staying steady, but you know, it's, uh, as the fixed rate goes up, as the find rate goes up, our fixed rate has to go up to, to uh, accommodate that. So I mentioned a little bit about the, the window of risk here, that the attacker doesn't care why the user is vulnerable, whether it's you know, that we haven't shipped a patch yet or the user hasn't got it applied. But either way, they're still vulnerable, and that's what the attacker cares about. And that's really what I care about as well. So we started tracking time to fix, um, and I think the, the industry has started to move away from counting just the sheer numbers of bugs and started looking at, okay, how long does it take to get that, that, that vulnerability um, patched? And we're getting, we're getting better over time, and we get a lot of support from the community. Like I said, we've got these 20,000 people running builds every night. That's you guys, right? You guys are helping us get these fixes up as quickly. We wouldn't be able, you know, who are we without you, right? This, this is the reason that um, the, the community is able to keep Firefox secure, because all these people are, are helping us with security updates. There's, 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 there's only so much you can do in terms of like, it takes time to identify the vulnerability, it takes time to come up with a fix, it takes time to build the fix, um, and it takes a lot of time to test it. But if you, can reduce, if you can reduce the time to test it, you know, you can make the biggest impact on how long it takes to get that out there. And then again, users have to get the, 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 the patch installed before it's gonna protect them. And um, so what we're doing is we're measuring um, based on these, these automatic update requests how long, what version people are, are, are running. It's completely anonymous, actually it's anonymized. And I'll take a time here to make a distinction between the two. Um, anonymous means like, you know, there's no data that you know, would identify you personally. Anonymized means we intentionally, as a privacy protection mechanism, made sure that we're not collecting anything that identifies you personally um, while we track, you know, uh, what version people are, are, are running on. We do that on purpose because, we, because privacy is important to us and that's one of our priorities. But well, basically what happens is that when you start up Firefox, it says, um, I'm running this version, is there a new version? And uh, Mozilla either says, yes, there is, or no, there isn't, and that's, you know, that's the end of the, of the conversation. So last year, I think I showed you this upgrade cycle, that it, that it takes, uh, it was eight days from the day 1506 was, was released to the day that 90% of our users were updated, and I thought that was pretty uh, great, eight days to get everybody updated, or you know, almost everybody update, updated. Um, this is the update cycle for 2004, and yes, that looks very much the same, but in fact, now it's, it's six days to get people updated. That took six days to get 90% of the user base updated. That's a 25% increase, and I think that's pretty significant because that means the window of risk is for, for the time to deploy has been reduced by 25%. And as I said, I think part of that is due to the auto update, the, um, the session restore feature in Firefox 2, that users recognize that you can go ahead and install the patch now because once Firefox comes back up, you'll be right where you left off. You know, so it's, it's a lot less painful for users, so they're more inclined to do it. So these metrics apply, you know, can apply to any software project, and I think it's important for you know, the rest of the industry to start look, looking at things like this. Like, but development environments have to provide this information in order for us to compare one project to the next. But if you can't compare one project to the next, at least you can compare within one project how they're doing individually. And it also helps uh, you know, get rid of a lot of the, the misunderstandings, I think, about, about number of bugs that it's not necessarily, like, if you identify 10 bugs, it's not that, you know, it's not necessarily, oh no, there's 10 bugs here. It's like, you know, great, we've got some tools that are great at identifying bugs, because once we know about them, we can fix them. Now, if you happen to be in an environment that doesn't, you know, fix security bugs, now you've got a problem. Um, but at least in the environments that are committed to fixing security bugs, knowing about them is better than not knowing about them. And of course, now helps you answer some of these questions from your management about, like, you know, you know, how are we doing and what should we, we be working on? And, helps you justify headcount for, for, for more people to help you out. So as we're looking at Firefox 3, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what are the best, what are the ways we can make the biggest impact in terms of security for Firefox? Uh, what are the tasks that users are doing? How can we make them more secure? And how can we leverage the community to uh, make security better for everybody? So this is about session restore, and we spoke about this a little bit, that, we're, that we see session restore as a security feature, but we're also looking at ways to make it a little bit uh, easier to install updates. And one of the ways that we're doing this is making updates more stable, um, making sure that they are less likely to cause problems with um, your add-ons, because people get mad if, you, if your security update breaks one of your add-ons that you're, you know, you're, you're really using. But it's up, to the, it's up to the user to actually accept the updates. We're not gonna force them on them. But the user actually has to accept it before they're protected. So we wanna make sure that they're not gonna be worried about things breaking. Some of the features coming up include uh, some of the malware protection that's going in there. Um, I'll talk a little bit about EV certs, uh, extended validation certs, and um, some of the UI stuff that's changing and some of the stuff that you, you can't see because it's under the hood. So 
this is the, the UI you see when you, when you browse with Firefox to a site that has been identified as a potential phishing site. One of the reasons this is important is that it's, uh, it's different than any other UI that you see in terms of errors. Like, uh, if, you, if you go to a site where the certificate is expired, you get this you know, really kind of you know, convoluted dialog box that you, looks like every other dialog box that you get that says, you know, oh, this is expired, and you know, what do you want to do about it? That's a, that's, a, uh, that's a lot of information to have to read um, to, you know, for a user who doesn't care. They're just trying to get on, they're trying to get on with the task they're trying to complete, and this is in their way, and click, 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 OK. Um, even I'm inclined, you know, I, I, I want to click OK just to get out of, out of, out of that sort of environment. And, you know, obviously, I know that this, it's trying to tell me something important. So what we're trying to do is create a UI that breaks the user out of the context that they're in and lets them know that something really bad's going on. So this is what it looks like when you browse to a phishing site currently in, in two. So we took that, and we're trying to uh, build on that and go to the next level. So this is what the UI might look like for um, visiting a, a site that's, that's uh, been identified as potentially having malware on it. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's red and it's, you know, it, 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 it completely blocks the, um, the site. So there's no, there's no way to click through here. That's one of the important things. That, like, you can't just say, okay, no problem, and accidentally click through. Because first of all, that's a pretty uh, dangerous looking, like, oh no, something happened, UI. But more importantly, there's no, you can't see the website underneath it. There's no, never mind, click through. If you are a researcher and you're actually trying to do something and you want to, you're, you want to evaluate the, you know, the malware uh, mechanisms through Firefox, you can turn the feature off. But you have to go through the preferences and, 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 and options and, and turn it off manually. And that's uh, something an advanced user will do because they have a, a, a need for it, because they're doing some kind of research on this malware site, potentially. But it's not something a user is going to do, because they'll see this, and this will be clear. The, the context is, is very clear. Something bad's happening, and no, we're going like, to not let you click OK and continue with it. So this is, this is currently the way things are, um, are, are planned, but you know, things change. So um, you know, don't go crazy with it. Don't take this as, as word. Nothing is done until it's actually done. And, uh, but you know, I want to give you a first look at, at, least, at least where we're going with it. Another thing that we think is really important is, is leveraging the, the, the community to, to protect o other users. So if you find a phishing site, you can add it to the database for other users by reporting web forgery. Now, this um, is, uh, is kind of a dangerous feature, right? Because you can just say, oh, well, www.vendoridontlike.com is, is a phishing site and uh, try and poison the database, right? There are, there are people using, there are people reviewing these manually. There are, um, there are a lot of mechanisms in place to prevent uh, false positives, and we take that very seriously. But we do want to make sure that if there is a phishing site that we can, we can identify it, it's reported by um, a user. And so I encourage you all to take advantage of this if you get you know, some nasty spam that's trying to you know, send you to, the, to a bank and, and enter your credentials and you recognize it as a phishing site, you can report it. And I think that's actually really important is uh, if Firefox crashes, you know, and it could crash for a number of reasons. Maybe you know it's it's a it's a you know programming bug, or but maybe it's it's a it's it's some nasty control trying to trying to or a nasty piece of code trying to do something um, that it shouldn't be, and you know it fails at it. These 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 uh these crash reports let us know you know that there's a problem in Firefox. So if you say yes and send us that, that information, we can use it to make the product better. So I'd like to encourage you all to do that. But you uh, researchers can also use it to you know potentially find a vulnerability yourself and in, in Firefox maybe and. Let us know about that, hopefully, uh, as well. So we think this is really important information, and we, we hope you guys can take advantage of it. Extended validation certs. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of these, but uh, this is this is a, a fairly new, um, a fairly new mechanism. It's basically a certificate that's a little bit harder, that's, that's significantly harder to get than a regular certificate. Um, the certificate authority does a lot more research on the entity that's applying for the certificate. So they can have a different, so, so that we as users can have a, a different level of confidence when we see the the EV start presented. Um, they're significantly more expensive, and uh, they they depending on the country that you're in, you, you go through a number of steps, including validating the business exists, and um, you know does it actually have a business license, and so on. It's significantly more um, involved than than you know what's currently out there, which is you know essentially do you have can you pay for this cert? Okay, here you go, here's your cert. Um, so this is a this is a a, a, a bigger step. So in other web browsers, we see you know um, some slight change in the UI, and we found that that the the way that the UI is implemented has a significant effect on whether or not it's effective. So we want to make sure that the UI says something about identity, right? Because uh, when we when we introduce locks, right, to let you know that there's an SSL connection, 
that um, you know, we're using HTTPS, people take that lock to mean more than it should mean. What it, it was intended to mean was this connection is protected, um, it, you know, is, 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 uh, is over SSL, and that was all it was intended to mean. Right? And people took it to mean, oh, this is secure, this website's secure, um, you know, you can go ahead and enter your credit card on this website. What, we're, what we want to make sure that people understand when they see the EB cert is that this is only making an assertion about identity. So we're using what we're calling internally Larry. Larry is the, uh, is especially for those of you folks from out of, out of town, out of country, right? Um, this is the guy at the passport who uh, you know, tells you where to go for immigrations, right? This is the passport check. So we think that this guy indicates a, uh, a different, uh, a different, he, he, a different message, right? He's saying passport control, identity check. He's not saying everything's secure, go ahead and give me your money. That's a, a, a very different statement. So we want to make sure that we're saying something about identity and nothing else, right? So Larry shows the site's identity. If you, if you go to a site that is using an EV cert, it'll tell you all the information that we have about, about the cert and it'll provide it to you in a way that makes it clear that what we're saying is only about identity, not about the security of the site. In the, in, in, in the context of mockups may, may change. Um, the green bar there, not sure if that's gonna be green or, or, or what, but that's where we are currently. But Larry also says something when you don't know anything about the site. So if you go to a site that does not have an EV cert, like Mozilla.org currently, um, it'll let you know that uh, we don't have an EV cert, so we can't make a state, a, a, any statement about the integrity of the site, but um, at, least you, at least you know what you don't know. Other things that we're implementing are um, mechanisms in, in, uh, in uh, evaluating how many times you've gone to the site and whether or not you've entered passwords before to help you identify whether or not this is the site that you intend to go to. So for example, if you go to your bank site, you've probably entered your password there before. In fact, you've probably been there several times. Maybe you go there every week or, every, you know, or several times a week. And so you've been there many, many times before. So if you've been there many, many times before, then you have a different level of confidence that you're at the same site again that you've always been at. If this is the first time you've been to, your, to the site, um, then it's probably not your bank, you know, because you've been to the bank several times before. Um, and so if this is the first time you've been there and know you don't have any safe passwords for it, then you start to get a little bit suspicious about it. But giving you this information so you can make a decision about it if you're, you know, if you're looking for this information um, and exposing this, you know, can help a user determine whether or not they're being fished or if it's a, if it's a real site or if it's the site that they've, they've seen before. So I think the, the security interface is actually one of the most important places that we can innovate, all of us, as, as a security industry. Because making it easy for users to make good decisions it will get us a lot further than all the mechanisms we can put in place. Because if the mechanisms, you know, if all the fancy mechanisms we put in place are difficult to use, then users won't use them. They'll find a way around them, around them. they'll click through, whatever. What we really need to do is make the mechanisms we have more understandable to the users so they don't have to be security experts to make good, good decisions. Or better yet, have the software make good decisions for them and let the users you know, change their mind if, they're, if, they're, if they you know, have different ideas about what they want to do. So we've been looking at this in, in terms of identity and encryption, um, what we know about the site, uh, summarizing security signals so you don't have all these different places to check. Is there a lock up here? Is there a lock down there? Is the bar green? You know, what, are the page, what does the page info say about this site? What about you know, under uh, under uh, the certificate information, you know, like consolidate the information, put it in one place, make it easy for the user to make a decision about the site. But this is true for, for all, you know, applications that present any kind of security information. This is not just a, a web browser issue. This is, I think, you know, something that, that you know, even, even applications that are targeted at administrators, you know, have too many security signals that are just, that are, are, are too difficult to keep track of and um, are painful. I think we could all improve on security UI in general. So a lot of the work that we're doing is under the hood. These are things that you don't necessarily get to feel. Um, I know users really like to, uh, uh, or when I'm talking to reporters especially, they really want to know about the features that people can touch. They want to know about malware. They want to know about the, you know, the EV certs, the things that they can see and how the UI changed. But most of the important work happens actually under the hood. And uh, this is the kind of thing that you don't feel unless, um, you know, until uh, you're not vulnerable to a particular issue that, that you, know, you otherwise would have been. And most, most of the time users aren't going to feel that. They're not going to see that. But um, going back to the mitigations that we talked about, or like, you know, how did you fix break, break OF by introducing mitigations that address an entire category of vulnerabilities? We've rewritten Reflow to address some of the, uh, the, the intense calculation issues that go on in layout. That's, that's, um, that's pretty significant. So, so um, DOM is, is a lot more resilient than it used to be, and, uh, and, and it's a lot more resilient to uh, you know, malicious content. And that's, that's pretty, uh, 
pretty significant for us, and that's a tremendous amount of work. But you know, you, you don't get to see it unless you're like you know, head, head buried in the code, which to me, you know, somebody, some, some people in this room probably are. Event handling has been uh, significantly improved, and um, you know, we, we noticed that we're seeing uh, race race conditions um, as potential as potential attacks, and so making that room more robust uh, eliminates those, well, mitigates those as a potential uh, category of vulnerability. Um, mechanisms to prevent um, uh, events from executing in the Chrome. So, you know, that's that's another category of vulnerabilities that we end up, uh, 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 you know, experiencing because we've got this JavaScript Chrome. Um, so, mitigations to uh, separate uh, the the Chrome from the content even further. Also, the cycle cluster. That's all our memory management stuff. Memory management. Um, uh, is, is, is a significant place for um, you know, some of the vulnerabilities that, that we've seen. Uh, a lot of the internal finds, not necessarily the external finds, but if you're, if you're following our advisories and you see like, oh, this you know, crashes with evidence of memory corruption, then you'll see like, you know, a bunch of bug numbers following that. That's what we're, that's what we're working on, these, this is some of the cycle collector stuff. So we've improved the cycle collector to, to reduce the risk of those kinds of vulnerabilities. And then we've uh, moved to Cairo, which is uh, a, a, a big project that's being run by a number of different, um, uh, it's, it's included in a number of different projects. So it's got a lot of eyeballs on it, and, and it's, it's great for us to be able to support that as a project. So we, we are working on tools, and one of the things I think is really important about getting these tools out there is that you know, we develop these tools internally anyway, right? We're, and I know a lot of development environments are doing this, a lot of other vendors are doing this, and looking right at you. <laughs> A lot of the vendors are doing this, and I think it's really important that that, way, that work not be lost, right? Like once, it, once that particular vendor is, is done with that work, um, you know, it might be useful to other vendors, especially other vendors that are making similar projects, right? So we've got um, uh, on the way these uh, HTTP and FTP protocol fuzzers that were developed uh, by Leviathan and Matasano, and we've already released the JavaScript fuzzer, but talking about these uh, HTTP and FTP, right? Like how many projects uh, implement HTTP or FTP? Like, Every network project, practically, right? Even uh, you know, management tools for for routers and for you know, printers and uh, you name it. They all implement their own um, their own versions of these. Like, there's there's so many people using these things. Um, you know, the tools that we all develop internally can be used externally. And the reasons we have for being scared as vendors to uh, make them available to everybody else are things that we can actually get beyond. So I want to encourage other vendors to do this. So that's one of the reasons that we're putting Mozilla's tools out there, getting feedback from the world and demonstrating that it can be done and trying to encourage other vendors uh, to do the same. So it is difficult because we worry that like we develop a tool, we put it out there, someone uses it to find a vulnerability in another product, you know, and, and we get sued and that's terrible, right? So we try to make sure that we give other vendors a chance to fix the bugs before they are the tools are made available broadly. And that's kind of a difficult proposition because we don't know everybody who could you know, find the tool useful. But that's true of a debugger or a compiler or you know, you know, any of the existing fuzzers and so on. The vendors are a little bit more um, sensitive to this thing because we, don't want, we certainly don't want to put users of someone else's product at risk, right? Like, um, and, my, and myself, I worked at Microsoft and I worked closely with the IE team and I consider the IE users my users still. So even if you, whether you're running Firefox or IE, you know, I still consider you somebody that you know, I worked to protect. So I wouldn't want to hurt IE users any more than I want to hurt Firefox users. So I want to make sure that we're doing this in a way that um, is safest for all these users. But there is a, a cost-benefit analysis here, and, and in doing it, I'm looking out there and saying, like, okay, these, these tools can be useful to other developed environments. Let's get those out there in a way that's safe. So in May, we contacted you know, all the major browser vendors and said, hey, we've got a JavaScript fuzzer here. We think you'll find it useful. We think you'll find it useful because we ran it and crashed your browser. But you know, <laughs> please you know, take a look at it, and um, if you find anything, you know, and you think it's useful, let us know. We need that feedback. And I need the feedback to justify releasing more tools. So. Um, so these are the first, the first sets that we've, that we've released. And um, uh, it, we so far we've gotten a lot of feedback, actually. So we released this, this uh, JavaScript fuzzer, which um, that, was in, that was the first week of August. Uh, within a couple of days, Opera let us know that they had found four issues, one of which was a, was a security issue, that they had builds out to patch them, and that in a, in a couple weeks later, they had submitted you know, additions to the tools, which is really what we want to see. That's the best possible outcome from this, that we put them out there. They're open source, they're free. And uh, you know, other people contribute to them, build them up. Maybe they find more vulnerabilities in Firefox, and that's that's great. Maybe they find vulnerabilities in the project that they're working on. That's great. If they're useful to anybody, you know, that's the, that's that's the idea here, right? And so, since we've 
you know, managed to release this, and you know, Opera's contributed to it. We've got a little bit of a collaboration going on. Maybe other vendors can see that, you know, hey, it's worthwhile. You can get your stuff out there. You're helping internet users, and um, you know, it's worth whatever pain it takes to get it out there. So the HTTP protocol fuzzers, which are coming as soon as we get um, vendors to say, you know, okay, these aren't these aren't painful tests anymore. Um, basically, it, the HTTP and FTP fuzzers work the same way. They both emulate a malicious, um, they both emulate a uh, an either HTTP server or an FTP server, and um, fuzz the client, uh, the client's handling um, of the protocol. So that's useful in that you know, as a web browser, if we are if we are connecting to a malicious web server and they are able to find some mechanism in our implementation of the protocol that allows an attacker to uh, compromise the product, that's something we want to see. So this uh, gives us an idea of, of of how well the application is handling um, FTP and HTTP um, traffic. So these are actually written by Michael Eddington, and they they are add-ons to his Peach Fuzz um, fuzzer fuzzing suite. And they've been you know, really useful for us, and I was actually you know, excited to see how well they stood up. But you know, because they because they wrote them for us on you know, under contract, you know, they're ours, and we'll make them available to everybody else. But this is like a, this isn't going to be a slow release because you know, again, HTTP and FTP are implemented in a lot of different places. The one we have released so far that's been successful in Opera, you know, found some issues with it is uh, the is JS Fun Fuzz, which uh, Jesse named Jesse Ruderman, and he's he's built a lot of tools for us. So we've got. Uh, dozens and dozens of fuzzers that he's written that I would love <laughs> to make available to you guys. But we've got to, first of all, fix all the bugs that he found um, in our tools. We've got to give them to all the other vendors that implement uh, JavaScript and wait for them to fix their, their bugs, and then we can make them available. So we're doing it, but slowly. And you know, over time, we want to make sure, we want to make the process go a little bit faster. So basically what he does is uh, it, it, it creates JavaScript functions and, um, and, then, and then runs them. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been quite effective for us. Found 280 bugs in, in Firefox, 27 of which were actually security bugs, and um, it's uh, it's it, it goes through it, it does you know recursive it does recursion it nests really deeply it's uh, um, it's a pretty nasty bug and it, it, or it's a pretty nasty fuzzer and it goes on forever and if you want to check out the bug um, as it's listed oops, got some double slides here oh I'm going backwards it's uh, it's available over here. And uh, I encourage you all to take a look at it and add to it and you know, find bugs in Firefox and, and, and let us know if you find other things. So there's some other, other places you can get um, information on, on Mozilla issues. And um, I'm blogging, not continuously because I'm busy. Um, but there's, I, could, I could be blogging continuously, there's just that much stuff going on. But you know, I try and blog when security issues come up, when uh, security reports come up that are you know, either you know, if I can offer some clarity to how, how they're being read or whether or not we think that they're interesting or, or demonstrate something about uh, you know, our project that we think is useful. Or if we, you know, if someone posts something to full disclosure and you know, doesn't give us a, a, a chance to fix it, you know, we, we can say, okay, well, here's what we think the issue is. Um, this is what we, you know, this, we know about this problem. It's been verified or we're working on a fix or we're still in investigation stage. But you can tell at least where we are on it and, and, and see what we're, what we're doing as we go. So that's where the blog is if you want to um, stay in touch with the Mozilla security issues. But there's a lot of ways to get involved. Like I said, you don't have to wait until the, the project ships before you can, you know, make your contributions to it. You can you can work with us at every stage of the process, and we'd love to see you do that. Um, but even if you're not a security uh, security tester, or if you're more of a uh, evangelist or a blogger, you can get involved with Spread Firefox. You can give us feedback and say, you know, hey, we like this, we don't like that. You can write an add-on. There's a lot of a lot of people security community creating security add-ons, which uh, you know gives a lot of, give us a lot of you know great ideas. Some of this stuff eventually gets incorporated into the core product. And um, you know, I love to see that happen. If it's if it's a, an add-on that the community likes, that you know gets a lot of attention, that you know is functionality people want, and it ends up in the core product. And I think that's uh, that's great to see as well. And um, of course, we're hiring, so you know, you can always come and uh, you know work for Mozilla a, as an employee. Um, and you know, even if you are just a you know just just a user, you can still run nightly builds. If you're feeling a little bit adventurous, you can run some of the beta stuff and let us know if you find any security issues with that. Any questions? No. <laughs> I do have uh, I do have wares for whoever asked the best question here. This is Panda Internet Security 2007, which does support Windows Vista. So, any questions? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any work being done to help users run 
Mozilla as like a less privileged user. Um, Windows doesn't make it easy to do. Um, so is there any way that, that you guys can help? Because the average user is not going to create an extra account, log in that way, log back out to do something as administrator and go back and forth. Yeah, we did investigate um, running Firefox as a, um, um, using the, 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 the privilege management mechanisms in, in Vista. And we found that that was actually quite painful. So it's probably not going to make its way into three. But um, we do actually have a lot of, of other mechanisms in place to, to, to sandbox the, the, the information so that the, uh, the extent of the attacker's uh, uh, scope is limited to you know, the process, but you know, nothing's perfect here. But it's something we considered and we are, we are, we are potentially working on maybe for, for 3.1 or, or whatever the next release is. But it doesn't look like it's going to make it into 3 at this point. But, you know. Miracles always happen. Sometimes when I say these things, it doesn't look like it's, it's going to get support. Someone hears me say that and they go, oh, well, I want to work on that. And then they go contribute time to that. And you know, if that's something you want to see and you're, you're in a position to work on it, you, know, you, could, you, could be the, you could be the person who makes the difference in whether or not it gets in for three. So if that's something you care about, come help us work on it. Yes? Hi. Uh, you may have answered this question. I'm sorry I came in late. But is there any plans to look at the priority order that the extensions are running and control those. The priority what? Priority order that the extensions are running. Um, to what end? Well, basically, if you look at, I mean, if, you've, if you're someone like me, you, you've got 30 different extensions, you want to control which extensions are run at which time when the browser opens. So there actually has been work that went into um, to help users manage their add-ons and extensions uh, more easily. So. I don't know if this will uh, address what you're looking at, but you can uh, manage your and, and turn things on and off and you know, manipulate your, your, your add-ons or sets of add-ons much more effectively in 3 than you can in previous versions. So um, in terms of you know, changing the order, I don't know if that in particular is in there, but there's a lot of work that went into that section. It's not one of the sections I'm most familiar with, but that might, um, be, that might address your um, issue. But you can download some of the new alphas and see if that works in there yet. Um, and if you come, come to me, if you send me an email, I will find the person who's actually working on that to follow up with you. Yeah, I had a question about how Larry's going to work. And I don't know if it's, I know it's probably still pretty new. I actually asked Mike a little bit about it at Black Hat. Is there going to be any support for, like, one of the problems with IE, how it handles it? is it just says, this is a bad SSL cert. It doesn't tell you why, it doesn't tell you it's expired, it doesn't tell you it's weak encryption, it, it just says it's bad, right? Is there gonna be anything built into Larry to kind of give you that information? So Larry is really just the, the icon that um, we're using to identify the presence of an EB cert. Okay. So um, some of the other u user uh, UI will tell you things like, you know, this is expired or, um, you know, it won't, uh, it won't, it won't indicate that an SSL connection is, is present, or if it's present, that it's not one that you can trust. So, yes, there's more information available. It's in the security uh, UI, and some of the information, some of the uh, panels that I showed will have information about um, the certificate that will uh, give you this, this information. But it's not necessarily Larry, who's only specific to um, the presence of EV certs and identity. Okay, okay. Because I guess one of the problems I had with Microsoft was you actually have to go to the page before you can determine any of that information. It'll flag up and say, oh, here's an issue with this SSL cert, but it won't tell you why it's an issue until you've actually visited the page. So the browser doesn't know. That's IE set, this is IE7 I'm referring to. The browser doesn't know, IE or, or Firefox, doesn't know anything about the page until you try to go there. So it's, you know, how, do you, how does the browser get the certificate to make a judgment about it? 